Hey everybody, welcome to this week's Q&As. I am shooting this video very slightly different than I have been, so if you're a video file or a fellow nerd, maybe take a look and see if you could tell if there's any difference. Hopefully no, but I'll swing back around to that at the end. I don't want to waste everybody else's time with it. And if you're listening on audio only, obviously it doesn't matter. But anyway, let's jump in and see what we got this week. First up, over on Patreon, Jason Guffey is currently redoing the layout of their soldering work area to be an L-shape 90 degree corner spot, and they're not sure if the actual soldering space should be straight along either of the two sides or tucked into the corner. Thoughts or suggestions on any of this kind of work area? So, I first of all, whatever works best for you is the right answer, but my opinions on this are from when I had that office in Brooklyn, from my setup now, and from when I had that tight but very efficient setup in New York, and I would say that I think a test CRT is the best place for, or, or the best thing to put in the corner, because it's kind of, you know, if you think about an L-shaped desk, right, that's a pretty deep recess, so I would think that would be best used with shelves or a CRT. I got one of those plastic spinners for like 10 bucks on Amazon, and I had a 14-inch one on it, and I would spin it around so that I could see uh, and get to the ports on the back, and then I could spin it back around so I didn't have to keep lifting a heavy monitor worked perfect that way. Um, and I had like a little mini metal rack in the office where I had my soldering equipment and it sort of worked and it sort of didn't. And I think the biggest difference being in the, the New York City apartment is I had a ton of stuff in front of me and a ton of stuff to the side. So same setup as yours. And it was all about arm's length and I didn't have to move any of it. And I think that was the thing to really pay attention to. So I could reach behind and turn on the power supply that turns it all on because I had them all running through a power strip just in case any of the knockoff desoldering iron or whatever I bought didn't have good power filtration. Um, and then I could reach back and turn the power switch on any one of these. And whenever I grabbed the desoldering gun, soldering iron, hot air rework, whatever else, even if I had to like reach down to get it, so the, the things that I would use the least I would put, you know, in the less easy to reach places, whereas like the standard soldering iron I would have right in front of me. But regardless of if I had to like lean forward a little or if it was right in front of me, I didn't have to move anything. And I think that was a big thing about having that little mini rack on the desk in the office is that would always tip. Like if you tugged a little too far, the thing might wiggle and now you have all this stuff on here. Whereas on those big shelves in New York, nothing moved. Like I could obviously pull it off the shelf, but that would require a lot more force than a little bit of tugging. So that was, you know, that was kind of the ideal thing in that everything was, you know, easily accessible, but once you had it in your hand, it really didn't have any, it, there was no tension anywhere. So I could just be working on everything right in front of me. Um, the CRT in the corner totally depends on your setup. Uh, if, you, if you remember the New York setup, I had the eight inch in the Ikea shelf. This one, I have that same one right next to me on a metal, uh, a, a big sturdy metal rack, not the little one. And that seems to be okay. So really the CRT thing's up to you. I just wanted to throw that out there. But yeah, I, I would just make sure wherever you place anything, even if you have to reach in to turn it on, uh, that you don't have to constantly pick things up and move them every time that you're working on something. Next, they found a good deal on an Ender 3 Pro 3D printer and picked one up, and they're a bit overwhelmed as far as getting started and what they can uh, or should print. Do I have any advice as to places for further wisdom and items they should print for a retro game setup? Uh, I would just go through Greg Laser Bear's social media posts and take tips from Greg, I mean, Greg's been doing this forever. His prints are excellent. Uh, I mean, he's grown from a very pro-level enthusiast to an actual pro store for this stuff. So I, I, that would always be my first choice. There's tons of little things that you could print. A lot of people start with like little toys and little knick-knack things just because if they don't come out perfect, you still have something, you know, like a, a little figurine you want to put on your desk or something like that. You know, fun stuff that don't really matter. And also stuff that doesn't take a long time. Because while, yes, a whole reel of 3D printing filament isn't that expensive relative to everything else we buy in retro gaming, spending eight hours printing something to find out it came out lopsided or you did it wrong might not work with you. Now, if you work in an office and you're the type of person that'll get up in the morning and go, okay, well, let me load up this print, press this button, and it'll be done when I come home. Maybe print yourself like a Raspberry Pi case or something. Who knows? But that's the only other thing is, you know, 
time is time is something I've learned to value way more than I ever thought when I, I, I really started pushing hard to do retro RGB first time so, or full time. So yeah, time is something I would keep keep in mind and plan around. And third, they're also looking to get some kind of beginner oscilloscope since they get into cable making. Uh, and they see that the Amazon one I linked to, the Rigel that I always use, is 400 and they're not sure they have that kind of money, so they've been looking at the smaller handheld ones. Are any of them any good, or should they save their money for the affiliate link one, objectively speaking? Um, here's the advice that I would give. I am not smart enough to give advice on oscilloscopes, but I am friends with people who are, and that's the very specific reason I got that Rigel, and I had the one Owan... O-W-A-N is the other one linked there. That's about a hundred bucks. I think it probably went up to like 115 or something. And here's what I can say about both of those. They do everything that we would need in retro gaming well enough. So the Rigel is one where I had a few people send me their scope plots where it didn't really match up. And turns out their scope was totally fine. It just it would you use it different than the Rigel. So that's why, you know, if you follow the instructions, they're not going to be spot on. And that's why when I took all my lessons from STI, I used the same brand so that I could just do everything the same. But if you're just talking about measuring video voltages and you don't mind using a PC to get the readings as opposed to having, you know, a nice big one with its own screen, I liked that Owan a lot. It totally did a perfectly fine job. Uh, wasn't the best I've ever used, but for measuring video signals and sync voltage and video voltage, it was totally fine. It was only two channels at once, but if you're going to be using a probe or something, it's probably not a big deal. So that would be my recommendation. And once again, it's not because I think I'm some scope expert. It's because I talked to people that know far more than I ever will. And not only did they make the suggestion, they've been consistently performing the way these people told me they would over the past four years or whatever I did that video. So yeah, I would suggest the O1 that I link to. And uh, yeah, it is an affiliate link, but hey, if you decide that uh, you wanna take the advice, but you think I'm an ass and don't deserve any affiliate codes, as I always say, put that link in an in private browser, delete the end off of it, take the main Amazon link, put it in your main browser, and there you go. You could screw me out of my half a cent for every purchase, that's fine. To be honest, I'd rather see everybody get the better equipment than worry about affiliate codes anyway. So hopefully I was able to point in the right direction. You also asked about the sink cleaner device. So I'm going to give all, all of you wonderful supporters a very quick preview and an opportunity to laugh at me. So let's move on to that. So I figure I will give all of you awesome supporters a sneak peek as to what I've been working on. It's with the SCART cleaner and its next version of it. There's a little bit of backstory. So if you really don't care about going direct analog into a capture card, please skip to the next section. Um, I think a lot more people probably would care than you'd think. So I'll give you a quick background. This is the SCART cleaner, originally called the SCART to DVI, but as many warnings as I put, people still thought this converted SCART to digital, and I kept getting emails asking why they weren't getting a picture on their flat panel when they used a DVI to HDMI cable. I really wish people would, would read at least the stuff in big red bold warnings on all the pages. But anyway, the purpose of this was to interface directly with a Datapath Vision capture card, which can accept direct RGB signals. However, it needs to be clean sync at a certain voltage, and you need to have a low pass filter built in or do some kind of oversampling. It's all in the video capture section. But the reason I chose a DVI cable our DVI connector was originally because I was looking for a plug style so that you could just stick this right into the Datapath Vision card, have it, you know, maybe have like thumb screws to hold it in and then just have your SCART connector right there. And when I couldn't find any of those, I mean, we searched forever. I assumed that you'd be able to get these little connectors that you could basically add almost no space to them. So that's why it was DVI, was because of the Datapath vision. I've explained this so many times, I cannot tell you how many emails I've gotten from people of, you know, Bob, you'd make more money of those if you used a VGA connector. Like, before you throw a ton of criticism my way, maybe read the page, but anyway, sorry. So what you ended up um, having to do was either use a DVI cable or use one of these connectors, which is long. So it ended up not being the best option only for form and function. If you had a shielded DVI cable, then 
Sure, actually, it would be great because you could sit this on top of your computer, run this around. But if you were in a small compact area and you wanted the least amount of cabling possible, this is what you would have to use. Now, from a signal point of view, it was perfect. It was just from a connector point of view. Now there's a little more leverage. The adapter itself weighs more than this thing with the SCART cleaner. So what we wanted to do was change this connector to a VGA connector because the VGA and uh, this is a backwards one, but a VGA to DVI connector like this is lighter, smaller, and will work the same exact way going direct into Datapath vision cards. Plus, you could also use the VGA connector to go into Extron cross points. So the criticism that I got about it should have been VGA in the first place maybe actually was a little bit right, knowing that they don't make those other connectors. So this is what we did. We just swapped the connector for a VGA connector, but we're in a global part shortage. So all of the VGA connectors we used to use and all the products that we made open source or whatever, were no longer in stock. So I very quickly scrambled to get a part number. I got the wrong part, the pinout was different, whatever. So. Um, I'll make another batch of these. I, I don't know if I'm going to do it all on camera, or maybe I'll just do it as one segment, like one three minute segment that I could use going forward. So I don't have to spend hours a week doing those ads. But, um, so this is what you're probably going to be waiting for. This is open source. We'll post the file soon. The only reason the files are not posted is because of stuff like this. I do not post open source stuff unless I've tested it to make sure, or unless there's big capital letters that say, you know, this is untested, try at your own risk. But as we've seen with the DVI connector, people don't read those. So I'd much rather just have this wait until I know it works. But essentially it's gonna be the same thing. If you going on to any VGA device, like the open source scan converters VGA input, you could plug this into the side directly because it's going to have a plug, not a receptacle style. So you can go right in and then you turn that into a shielded SCART input, which I think is absolutely hilarious, by the way, because you could also use the HD15 to SCART to take a VGA signal and route it through the SCART port for that use of the uh, low pass filter. But so yeah, it's, it's now this will be for that. It'll be still for data path vision cards, just using this exact same thing, just sh a shorter one so that can go directly in. Uh, and of course you could also use this to interface with Extron cross points. You have a PlayStation one or two SCART connector that you want to strip the sink. Um, probably recommend really only using this for PS1, PS2. You really can not use component video. Uh, so yeah, this is, um, same exact design, same exact layout, just parts were swapped to compensate for the part shortage. Uh, and now we have to fix the VGA connector. So, um, I'll have a video about that at some point, just because I want to continue to encourage these open source projects. The other thing that I wanted to follow up on is years ago. Now I said there was going to be a follow-up product. We released the open source design for the comp cleaner component video in to output. It's got the same issues in that. I think it's got the DVI connector still. Um, so, and that one had switches that would allow you uh, dip switches to select what resolution you're going or you're inputting so that it would apply the correct low pass filter. Generally speaking, when you're using one of these, it's only going to be 15 kilohertz. If you had a 480p signal go through here, it wouldn't work at all. I mean, it would work, but the low pass filter wouldn't work. So what we eventually wanted to swing back to do was make one device that had SCART and component and VGA in that had dual output, probably SCART and VGA, or maybe SCART and DVI, or a VGA, DVI, whatever. Well, we were still going to figure that out. And then um, have some kind of filtering switch to do exactly that. Select what resolution you're inputting so that you could filter it properly for use for a bunch of different things. But then we went down the rabbit hole of trying to do some kind of sync regeneration to fix all of the sync issues with the A and H series BVM monitors. And that's where we got stuck. Um, and that kind of fell to the wayside because there was a lot of other products that the same people who were contributing to this were working on that respectfully were definitely more important. <clears throat> more important meaning thousands of people might have benefited from the next projects, whereas hundreds, if that, would benefit from one SCART or one analog cleaner device. That's what we were going to call it. So that's the full rundown. That's where we're at. The short term future is one of these is going to be available. Hopefully, oh, if I don't drop it and throw it on the floor, <laughs> one of these will be available within like a month or so. Open source, you can make your own. 
Uh, hopefully people will build them and have them for sale because it is pretty a lot easier for some people. I think we're going to get a 3D printed case made for this. Also, hopefully open source so people could print their own. Jason, maybe that's something for you to practice on. But the future is what I'm really concerned about. Is there anybody listening that has the ability to work on that other open source project where we combine all of that stuff together and we're able to regenerate the sync in a way that doesn't delay it so much that light guns won't work, but, and this is not lag by the way, it's sync delay, but also would correct the issue with any of the A and H series BVMs as well as a lot of other stuff and have a switchable uh, filtering. We were told that one of the best ways to go about doing this might be to use an FPGA, but now with the part shortage, it's definitely going to be swung back to just using things like an ISL chip, an LM1881, a 7374, and a bunch of logic and switches to stick that all together in a way that uh, ensures proper voltage and all of that stuff. So that was the full you know, the full lineup and the, the full story about that kept it under 10. Hopefully this isn't going to bore people to death who didn't skip to the next section, but I just wanted to keep everybody updated, explain what the heck this was in the JLC PCB ads and, uh, and kind of give you a future to the project. Firebrand X wanted to chime in about the discussion regarding the one chip O3 and its failure from last week. Um, Firebrand had some tips that I think would apply to anybody doing this mod, not directly to the Remora's mod because of just the things that we went through, but I still wanted to shout them out anyway because they're good tips. If you get a one chip O3 and you need to use cables that sync on C-Sync, the best way to go about doing that is to get the C-Sync restoration kit available on console five. They're small surface mount components, but with some patience, you could do it. Definitely use flux, tweezers, a magnifying glass if you have it, and just be very patient because you could accidentally bump into the components around it. Also, it could be that it, the reason this happened was because the wrong cap was removed. We already kind of went over that last week, but that is something I wanted to mention in that if you're going to do this mod or if you're going to do any of the bypasses on a one chip O3, double, triple, and quadruple check which ones that you're removing. Make sure the board is oriented correctly. That's a mistake I've made plenty of times. For me, or for this particular scenario, it sounded like the Remora ended up getting a console that had issues before the mod was ever done. And that's kind of what my gut's telling me on this one. But I wanted to share FBX's um, opinions on this because this is something that would apply to people looking to bypass the one chip 03. However, I do have to always repeat. First and foremost, if you're using a one chip 03 with a RGB SCART cable that syncs on composite video or on Luma, you don't need to do anything. You could just use it and the RGB output is excellent. However, if you're crazy like I am, then, and you want to bypass it to get just a hair better clarity, then you can do an RGB bypass that bypasses the onboard encoder and uses a more modern encoder in order to amplify that RGB signal. What I think is happening, total speculation, total guess, is that while, yes, the THS7374 is a more modern amp that is a little bit better, I think what's actually happening is you're removing the signals from a motherboard. Basically, you're removing all of the interference that every motherboard would generate that would affect analog video. And by moving those wires off the, uh, or by tapping them, the RGB signals right off the chip, moving them off the board and onto this new one, you're just bypassing all of that inherent interference. And that's what's getting you the slightly cleaner look. So it's not necessary at all. If you're gaming on a very good RGB monitor, you might not even notice a difference. But if you have a calibrated BVM, if you have a scaler that's going to a 4K TV, you might notice a difference, but you don't have to. So I just want to always be clear about that. Saying he has a new Net City arcade cabinet with a tube on it that doesn't have any burn in, but it does have some fisheye on the left side. Is there a good resource on how to adjust these older CRTs, or can I make a video on how to? They're located in the Philly area if anyone could help out. So I have to immediately wimp out and say there's no time for me to make a video on this and because uh, I would have to talk to the experts, do a bunch. The research I do for the videos I make is probably too much, but I don't like to just throw stuff out there unless it's something fun like the CRT magnet one. And even that, I ended up spending hours and hours and hours trying to find new shielded speakers. But anyway, back to your question. Um, 
I think what you might want to do is look around at different forums and talk to different people who have run into the same issues and see if anybody has found a fix. And it doesn't have to necessarily be a new net city, but maybe there's something about those because there's so many different factors that go into CRTs. And the one thing that you definitely have to keep in mind whenever you work on arcade machines is these were handmade and calibrated to itself. And then if a technician ever worked on it, if the tube was ever swapped, if the chassis was recapped, they're working on that one. So it's not like a case where, you know, console manufacturers kept all of the revisions mostly the same. And if you had the same problem on one, you'd probably have it on the rest. Each one of these are fairly unique. So while there might be an issue with new net cities, there might specifically be an issue with yours. And that's where experience and expertise really takes over. It's people who have seen the problem before, already done all of the diagnosis to figure out where it's coming from. That would be the issue. So I would check on arcade forums. Um, you know, if anybody's in the Philly area, comment, maybe, uh, you know, collaboration time or something, but it should be fixable. Uh, but I would double check with other people that have done the same thing with the same problem and try your best to take decent picks. And by decent, I don't mean go buy a bunch of camera equipment. I mean, you know, hold your cell phone, try to focus it, try to get it at the right angle, try to angle the picture. So even if it's not, you know, perfectly centered, maybe it reduces the moray pattern so people could see more of the problem and less of the, the weirdness that you get when shooting a CRT. So you know, hopefully I could point you in the right direction for that, but I don't have any just advice that I'd be comfortable giving you because stuff does get complicated. Logan wants to know what consoles I think are the most overrated or underrated and why, in my subjective personal opinion. So just opinions, not like a fact checklist. And please remember that my background is hardware development and hardware design. And while I've done IT and tech writing and all of the stuff that I've talked about, that's my favorite passion is computer hardware, electronics hardware. So while I like video games a lot, I love the hardware that goes into them. And no hardware is worth using without really good software. So while it's not quite your question, I think all of the underrated stuff out there is a unique combination of hardware and software that got completely overlooked, probably because of a lot of stuff that sucked on that platform that overshadowed it. And I think the perfect example is 3D because I could use this example starting from the 80s all the way through today and that the Sega Master System 3D games, if you play Missile Defense 3D, that's just a hilarious, awesome 80s experience of 3D glasses and a light gun and you're shooting missiles. And, you know, if you play OutRun and Afterburner or uh, OutRun and Space Harrier 3D, they're fine. At the time, you know, in the 80s when they were released, it was probably amazing. I definitely remember playing it on a TV in the late 80s and was just blown away at how cool Space Harrier 3D looked. You know, not sure that stood the test of time, but Maze Hunter or Maze Walker, if you have the Japanese version, did. Because that was a combination of really awesome software with the 3D glasses hardware that absolutely used the 3D depth to make the game better. And there were a few other 3D titles that kind of sucked. And that statement and that description applies to the Virtual Boy and even the 3DS. Because while the 3DS certainly wasn't underrated, the 3D effect was because there were so many games that were terrible with the 3D effect. And it's easy to overlook all of the games that really used the 3D effect to their benefit and made the game feel better and, and, and deeper visually, not emotionally. And, uh, you know, or maybe, maybe that's if you're into that stuff. So for me, that's what I think is always underrated is a combination of hardware and software that's unique and awesome, but is overshadowed by a bunch of other crap on the platform. What I think is overrated is modern stuff that gets put through a hype engine. And what I mean by that is stuff that's hyped up in, you know, the year 2000 and everybody thinks it's going to be awesome. We're 20 years later. We're going to look back at that and have a much more grounded and realistic opinion of its place in history. And while there's always going to be the fanboys and the haters of everything, you could really see that all platforms, you know, you mentioned GameCube and Xbox. I think both of those get looked back at very realistically and the, the good games are highlighted. The bad ones are, are ignored and it kind of just goes from there. I think they're both great platforms, but I think 
the most overrated stuff is always things that go through the hype machine and people get emotional about it and completely forget about facts. And I guess the best example I can give is there's been a few things released in the past four or five years that myself and other hardware enthusiasts and other people behind the scenes who kind of see what goes on have called out from day one as being vaporware or total crap or a cash grab or a a scam. One of them I I still think kind of might be. And the moment you, you talk about something that's already getting hyped up and overrated. You know, I, I just remember every time I said this thing's going to fail, here's why. I just would get hate mail and messages and all that crap the moment the podcast was released. And my track record's pretty damn spot on for that. because Not because I'm smarter than anybody, but because I've been in hardware design, I've seen this stuff come through, and you see the teams of people working on it, and you kind of know what to expect next. So anything overrated the most overrated is all of the stuff that people talk about how awesome it's going to be that either never release or release and flop like a wet towel no one really gives a shit so that could have been so many platforms uh you know from the gizmondo to you know to whatever else that you want to pick up on so hopefully that was a decent enough answer Polly Walnuts is looking for a way to output component video from a mister through a component switch and out to two CRTs. They know the G-Comp switch would be the cleanest solution, but it's expensive and they currently can't find it in stock. They already have a different switch that they're satisfied with, but the problem is it only has one output. Could they use this in their signal chain after the switch to split the signal? And what they have linked to is an in-day HDTV component video distribution amplifier. So it's one in, two out, it's $65, it's powered, and it, uh, it, it lists as being able to individually in- amplify each signal. And I think that's totally perfect. I think that would work. If you're talking about the mister, you could use its HDMI output through a converter. You'd have to check the direct video page. It's not as easy as just using a DAC. You'd have to add, I think, one resistor, but you'd have to put it in line. Um, Hopefully there's people making stuff to make all that easier, but you could look into that. So you use the IO boards output and the HDMI output. Um, but I think this is a perfectly good choice. 65, you could always use it on any component video source. There shouldn't be any logic in here. It should just be an amplifier. And it says HDTV, RGB, YPV, PR. It doesn't mention resolution. I can't imagine that there would be a problem with 240p because there's no scanning logic in it. So I would say give that a try. If 65 bucks is worth it to you, definitely do it. That's the type of thing where I would say if the G comps were in stock, I would take a look at your existing switch and say, is the switch working fine or is it adding interference? Like if you have a console directly into your monitor, does it look good? Then you put it through the switch and it looks different. If that's the case, then maybe you would benefit from spending extra money on a G comp. But if it doesn't do anything or if it's not in stock, this should be totally good. So um, that, while I've never tested it myself, that appears to be okay. Please remember, though, that I just went through this with JBL and they stopped shielding their speakers. So all of their documentation said that they were shielded. You know, everything I messaged their team and the team said they were shielded because they were probably reading the same documentation uh, and it wasn't. So if that shows up and there's no power supply with it, then I would be careful. But it seems that all of the clues point to this being a perfectly fine solution. Oliver Clare is having a problem with their GBA consoleizer kit. Um, It's a long post, so just in respect of everybody's time, I'm going to skip to the end, but I read every word. And here's the overview. They purchased a GBA consoleizer kit and had it assembled by a recommended installer. And then when they received it back, it only worked with about half of their original Game Boy Advance carts. So I'm going to pause and stop right there and say that that is probably a sign that something was wrong with the Game Boy Advance that you used before the install even happened. It could have been an installer issue. It could be a Game Boy Advance consoleizer issue, but my gut is telling me that if it won't work that way with original carts, or it won't work properly, the Game Boy Advance itself might be an issue. Now, down at the bottom of this post, you mentioned that you tried multiple power adapters, including a 2.5 amp one that you would use with an iPad. I think that would be more than enough to power this thing. 
because I think I remember powering my GBA Z off of my TV at one point. So, uh, and I definitely powered it from the USB ports on my computer. That's for sure. So, I'm pretty sure a 2.5 amp power charger would be more than enough. So right off the bat, something's wrong with the setup. Now, Oliver also went on to talk about how EverDrives were having problems with it. And I absolutely have seen the Easy Flash Omega have issues with the Game Boy Advance consoleizer, but never an EverDrive. And I, all of my testing I use EverDrives for because it's just infinitely easier to fire up a 240p test suite, than move to another game, etc. So absolutely, I have used it. I've used many different versions of the EverDrives, both Game Boy Advance and original Game Boy, and I've never had an issue on the three Game Boy Advance consoleizers that I've had for extended periods of time. So what I would definitely say is that contact the installer or maybe, you know, check out forums or places where people do these installations and see if anybody's run into this. Is it a capacitor? Is it a specific chip that's an issue? That's something that I would really look into to see because it could be the consoleizer kit, but if it's not playing original games, that might be an issue. Um, for anybody listening, Oliver also tried making sure they used a wireless SNES controller as well as the wireless ones just to make sure it wasn't too much power draw and did a bunch of other good troubleshooting, like try other EverDrives. It's not just the two that Oliver had, but two more. And all of it seemed to fail. However, those EverDrives seemed to work perfect in a GameCube with a Game Boy Player. So all of the signs seem to be pointing to the Game Boy Advance board itself. Could still be the consoleizer, could still be the installation, but that's what my gut's telling me. I could be wrong, but I feel like that's a, a safe and confident place to start is the GBA board itself. So it's probably not what you wanted to hear, but that's definitely what I'm going to suggest is look into that first and then kind of go from there. Josiah Wilson has a JTAG modded Xbox 360 connected to a setup that's primarily SCART, and they're trying to get that to 100% RGB just so they don't have to toggle back and forth between input formats. The only console left is the Xbox 360, and they have the official Microsoft VGA cable, but since they're connecting it to a multi-format PVM and not a VGA monitor, they need a solution to combine sync. They already have two, the Xtron RGB192 and the HD15 Discard dongle, both of which should work fine, by the way. What they get is a mostly stable image that's very dark, tinted purple, and the color streaks on the brighter elements. It's the same image when either using the SCART adapter or the Xtron, and both of those sync combiners work fine when connecting their Nintendo Switch via an HDMI to VGA dongle. Currently, they're using Monster Component Cables, which are, I guess, currently they've tested with Monster Component Cables, which look fine, but they have to go into the monitor's menu to switch the format from RGB to Component, then back when they're done. So that's a good troubleshooting step right there. The 360 is outputting properly, it's just outputting analog properly, just not VGA in your setup. So that's the only console they have to do that for, so they want to keep it all RGB, so they figured they would check before giving up. Full setup is an extra Xbox 360 with the VGA cable, and Microsoft's official site lists the S model as compatible. It goes to either the Xtron RGB192 or HD15 to SCART, to a G-SCART Lite, outputting via SCART to BNC cables, to a PVM20L5. They don't think it matters, but they're daisy-chaining the output of that PVM to a couple of other monitors. So you already did a great troubleshooting step by testing the component video and by testing the sync combiners themselves. So you've done half the work, but you have a little bit more to go. The first thing I would try just because it's the easiest is flip the switch on the G-SCART switch light to see if it's sync stripping or combining or whatever the, the sync filtering on the G-SCART is doing is affecting this. Uh, probably not, but I think that's the easiest thing because you just have to flip a switch. The next thing to check, if you have a VGA monitor available. Now, in this case, a CRT would be cool, but any monitor with a direct VGA input, try that and see what happens. Um, if you don't, then, you know, obviously if you try that and it's a problem, it's either the Xbox or the VGA cable. If you don't have that, what you could try is going directly into the 20L5 uh, in, and the easiest way to do that would be with the Xtron RGB192 because it's already got the BNC outputs. Um, 
And if you did that, I would disconnect all of the daisy chained monitors. So you, you basically want to keep eliminating components until it's down to nothing. So if your Xbox 360 with this VGA cable, with the Xtron that you've already proved works directly into your 20L5, and there's no issues, then keep adding stuff until there is. Is the daisy chaining of other monitors somehow messing with this? Could be. I don't think so. Um, is it any of the cables that are used in between? Oh, sorry, a bird just flew into the window right as I, <laughs> right as I recorded that. <laughs> I'm going to leave that in. What the hell? Why not? Uh, it lived. It just bounced off, got scared, and flew away. But uh, anyway, um, kind of shook me out of my moment for a minute there. Stupid bird. Uh, so yeah, just take every component and test it one at a time to see. Um, and then just back out till you figure out what the issue is. But, you know, my gut's telling me that toggle the switches on the G-SCART just in case but it could just be that VGA cable. It could be a damaged cable, but you need to separate each of these components really just to make sure. So um, good troubleshooting start, uh, continue on. And if you don't mind, please check back in and let me know because I'm pretty curious to see what the problem would be. Jason Guffey posted an experience about making their own distribution amp multi outputted thing. And I wanted to share it because I think it would apply to a lot of do it yourselfers that need these types of solutions. But basically Jason wired up a cable to output from an N64 to an Xtron 192 sync compiler device through its D sub input and then used its pass through and its RGBS output in order to have two outputs from the N64. Now these Xtrons require TTL sync, so that has to be kept in mind when making the cable, but overall I think it's a pretty good idea and it should be totally safe to use. But I wanted to bring this up because there are lots of do-it-yourself options that are kind of hard for people to make in bulk or it would be very expensive and not a lot of people would use it, which is why it doesn't exist, but you could do things like make your own cable and for something like an N64, especially one that's been RGB modded, you could take the RGBS output and you could have that separated and you could also have S-Video and composite. And in most of those models, they're discrete outputs. Uh, I say most just because I haven't tested every single output of every single one, but you should be able to take each discrete output and use it simultaneously, which means that if you really wanted to go into a CRT with S-Video and your scaler for RGB, you could do that by just making a cable that breaks out all of those signals. And that's not a Y circuit because the Y and C circuits for S-Video are their own discrete circuit, RGBS are their own discrete circuits, and you're not splitting any of them. You're just pulling each individual pin off of the multi-out. Now, as always, disclaimer, not every console can do this. If it's got a CXA chip in it, it can. If it's got a THS chip in it, it can. But the Nintendo ones are proprietary. proprietary. Maybe they can, maybe they can't. I think they can, but I have to put that disclaimer because I don't want anybody blowing up their consoles. But yeah, there are many ways to get multiple outputs. I do hope that there's at the very least some kind of open source homebrew solution available. So that way the tools and all of the boards are available to do this and people don't have to worry about, well, you know, I can't make them in bulks of a hundred because I'm only going to sell 20 a year and, you know, they'd have to sell for a hundred bucks each to break even. I think at the very least, if there was an open source design or an inexpensive mass produced design, I think this would be really cool. So hopefully some enterprising people could get on this, but thanks for sharing the story, Jason. Dan Bailey said, after watching the speaker interference and CRT video, a thought crossed their mind. Have I considered making a video about degaussing tools, specifically recommendation for specific tools, do's and don'ts, or any other variables in addition to a how to use section? Um, that is something I would like to do. I am so backed up. I, I pretty much have months of my life covered as to what's coming next and, and what I could do. So hopefully other people on there would be willing to do it. Um, you know, retro RGB is all about celebrating everybody else. So if somebody does a, a good video with all the facts straight and good info, I'm happy to share it. The only prerequisites for ever being on, featured on retro RGB is your information is good. It's not just, you know, speculation and crap. And you don't have some kind of, you know, insane thing attached to you. You never doxed anybody and then laughed at them. You know, you never started an awful rumor about somebody because you were jealous their website got more hits than yours. Like, you know, as long as you didn't do anything absolutely batshit crazy and your video or post or whatever else is good, you're welcome. 
You could call that gatekeeping. I'm fine with that, though. So, uh, you know, b- feel free to discuss, but uh, I- I'm okay keeping that gape, but gape. Gate. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Dan, also thanks for the, the congrats on the weekly roundup. But yeah, I'm going to have to defer in the short term to somebody else. At some point, I would love to go through all of this stuff and do both short little videos on it and more in-depth videos as to why this happens, you know, the technical aspects of it. But time is really the factor here. So hopefully somebody else will jump on it. Or maybe there's somebody else who already made some awesome videos. If you all wouldn't mind sharing with me, I would love to write them up then and post them or the very least pin a link to this video a tonal assassin just got a sony 14 n5u from ebay that got damaged in shipping they were wondering if i knew a repair person in the tri-state area that could give it a look and see if it's able to be repaired or sold for parts um so most people that i work with daily are, are backed up i have friends that have been working on my stuff and you know they're probably two months backed up. Uh, so I don't know if I want to just shout out people's names because I don't know if they'd have the time to be able to work on it. But if anybody knows of anybody, you know, then definitely, you know, shout out in the comments. One thing that I would say, though, is in this situation, what is damaged on it? And what do you think needs to be replaced? So if it's the back plastic, that's something that you're probably going to want to take the metal case off and be careful. I know I say this every time, but there is a small but realistic chance of death when working on CRTs. There's zero chance of death when doing a lot of these other mods we talk about, other than getting hit by a meteor when you're doing the mod or something. So be careful, but you should be able to take the back off and look. Is the neck board broken? Did the back plastic smush in and break the neck board? At that point, contact Steve from RetroTech, see if he wants to pick it up cheap for parts, Um, get your money back from shipping and eBay and all of that stuff, of course, but that's pretty much going to be a donor unit then to people who need it. Are the front buttons smashed, but the rest of it's fine. It's still a ton of work because I think you have to take apart a lot of stuff to get to the front buttons, but that's totally fixable. And that's something that anybody with enough experience and patience and space, that's certainly the thing I learned in New York, to disassemble a monitor and be able to spread the parts out. You know, if you got a garage or a workshop or a basement you could work in, perfect. You, you know, you, you could still try to disassemble that. And you may or may not feel comfortable doing that yourself. That's up to you. But that's something that's a lot more just are you mechanically inclined? Are you somebody who, you know, has done work on your car? Then you could probably figure this out. Successfully done work on your car, I guess I should say. Um, and, you know, same thing. And try to find different, you know, different things on the spectrum for that. Is it a dented case? So you don't want to power it on because the case is dented. Try to get in there with like a, um, a piece of metal and a hammer and tap the case back out so it's not touching any of the circuit boards. And then look with a flashlight. Is the circuit board cracked? That would be dangerous. Don't turn it on. Is it totally fine, but it's just bent and dinged? You know, there... Or is the glass cracked? You know, from visual inspection, can you tell how bad it is? If the answer is no, then you're stuck contacting anybody else anyway. But if it's damaged beyond reasonable repair, I would call that a donor parts unit to people who work on CRTs. But if it's cosmetic or functional or anything like that, it's probably totally fixable. But either way, try to get your money back. Um, You know, I've bought a few monitors off of eBay that um, half showed up perfect the other half were were boxed terribly but showed up good enough i've been really lucky with those shipments but um the ones that showed up good enough they were still cracked and broken and i was still able to get at least a partial refund and i never scumbagged anybody i never asked i never bought like a 500 hundred dollar monitor that showed up with a little crack in the plastic and i asked for the whole thing back it was always very reasonable but i would definitely just make sure you get some or all of the cash back from that Nurtech said they watched my interview with Zez Retro. A fair amount of it was focusing on the negatives of running retro RGB, and they get that I was venting with a friend and it might not be representative of how I normally feel in any given day, but they wanted to take the time to thank me for everything I do for the retro community. Thank you. It was very nice of you to say. I appreciate that. But you got the first part totally right. Um, Most of the videos I do are focused on positive things. And when I do say anything negative, it's sometimes it slips. I'm just a human and I'm grumpy that day. But if it's ever intentional, it's because it's very important to me because I want to save you money or or 
save a developer from getting ripped off or highlight something that is important to everybody who buys this stuff and spends their money on things or, you know, warning, this voltage is too high. You know, it, whenever I talk about anything negative, I like it to stick. So I try to keep all negativity out of the videos and out of the, any of my content unless I need to or unless it's silly, of course. But and I think because of that, I kind of I end up keeping a lot of it in and I end up venting it sometimes when it's not on anything directly retro RGB related. Um, it's kind of like what I said in the video about swearing. Like I, I only swear in these when I, I really think it punctuates a point or when I'm being silly, like when I beep out swears that I'm a dork that laughs at my own jokes. I always laugh at those. So, uh, so yeah, you know, I think you, you nailed it. I was venting with Lewis. I was exhausted and tired and I was also nervous talking about things that I normally wouldn't talk about. So I guess that kind of put a negative cloud on it, but I think Lewis did an awesome job. Um, I obviously wouldn't have done it and wouldn't have said okay to letting him release it if I had a problem with it, but nope, it, he was the perfect person to do it with. Everything was, was fine, and your assumption was correct in that most of the time, I'm having a great time doing this, and I love it, and you know, there is some bad shit that everybody has to deal with, and sometimes I, I eat a little more shit than I have to, but uh, I guess it's just part of doing this. The next thing that you said was that you saw uh, you saw me at too many games a few years ago and was curious if I was planning on going to it this year. Um, no, the only expos I'm going to this year are the one in Sao Paulo, Brazil, which is I'm so excited for that. Never been to Brazil. I cannot wait to meet my Brazilian friends over there. Uh, and also Retro World Expo in Hartford in the last weekend of August. Um, I've been to every Retro World. It's my favorite of these expos. Uh, it's not the biggest, but it, all the right people are there. I hear rumors that there's going to be some pretty awesome guests this year. And I'm not talking about me. I mean, other people. <laughs> I'm not being stupid and talking about me. I mean, you know, awesome people that, um, that you may or may not expect to be there. I, I'm definitely going to be there for both days. At the very least, I'm going to have a booth like last time, but I hope to be part of more things. Uh, it's just, I, I love that one. And I, I always kind of want to do something with it. So if you're in the US, um, especially if you're close to being on the East Coast, that's the one I will without a doubt be at. And obviously, if you're in Sao Paulo, I would love, would love to see you. Uh, you know, because I'm being open and honest, because we're talking about behind the scenes stuff, I normally wouldn't. The honest truth on why I'm not going to more of these expos is just the cost. Um, so you know, it's not just the hotels, you know, I got a gas or rent a car, depending like when I lived in the city, I had to rent a car. And that was even more expensive because renting a car from a place in Manhattan is nuts. So uh, that's the cost of it, you got to pay for food, you know, all of these things cost so much more than you would imagine. The props for the, the, the things that I'm doing, like, all that stuff kind of adds up. And while emotionally it was worth every penny, I loved doing them. I loved meeting all of you. It was so much fun. Um, if I, you know, I think 2018 or 2019, I did like seven or eight of those things. If I did that this year, I'd be broke. I wouldn't be able to pay for my mortgage. So it's, you know, it's just one of those things where I would love to do more of them, but, it, you know, I would have to work with the expos in order to do that and, and figure out the best way to do it. And, you know, it, it, that's a spoiled influencer thing to do. Oh, if you want me there, pay me. Uh, you could interpret it any way you would like. I hope that people are interpreting it the way that I mean it and that however you would like to look at life, things cost money and I don't have all extra to throw around on stuff and it's, it's not good or bad it's just you know ones and zeros um i hope people don't interpret it like oh you need to pay me to be places that's anybody that's ever met me anywhere knows that that's not how i roll at all but it is just the truth that i would love to go to every one of these expos um but i don't have the time i don't have the time to hunt a lot of these things down and at the same time, too, there's been a few times where I reached out to people and they were like, "Ugh, I mean, you have 50,000 followers. Are you even going to bring a crew? And like, hey, could you fill a small room? And it's like, I feel like such a dirtbag trying to have to explain to people that I run RetroRGB.com. You know, like there, there's a lot more than just how many followers somebody has on Instagram that determines who's going to show up to these events. And I feel gross doing that. So I'm not good at self-marketing. I just, so yeah, that's just some inside info into it. Hopefully that was interpreted positively, but you know, you're welcome to interpret it any way you'd like. But more importantly, thanks for the kind words in our tech. I appreciate it.
A couple of things from Rick Lewis. First, in regards to me asking about a database of movie and TV aspect ratios and transfers, Rick wanted to suggest IMDb, which is, I think, everybody's go-to for a lot of things, but also LDDB, which is a Laserdisc database of information. Uh, Bernie also shared the website shotonwhat.com with me, which I think scrapes a bunch of others, but I think all three of those are great sources of info. Um, I'm still looking for people's recommendations of square-ish uh, movies that or, or didn't have a clean transfer. I think that really, or a super clean transfer. I think that would be what I'm looking for for VHS tapes. And uh, I haven't heard back from the whatnot sellers. I really do think they must think I'm nuts for, for asking to collaborate randomly, but whatever. I'm me. I'm fine with it. <laughs> but um, So good info on that. Also, uh, after watching the video about shielded speakers, they noticed that their soundbar was sitting right in front of their CRT, so they waved it in front of a picture, and it screwed up the colors. So now they're, they were glad they were able to move it away from the TV, but they wanted to know how far they should put it. And there was no color distortion when it was right under the TV, but to be safe, it's 18 inches away. So speculation time. First of all, I don't know the solid answer to that, but I think I have a solid enough guess um, first of all, magnetic fields are, are mostly directional, so that the fact that it was under your TV, it could have been safe there. What you would have wanted to do is put it back in the same spot it was in and move it left and right or back to forth with the, the color bars on and see if the colors changed. Because remember, if it's in one spot, you know, nothing's moving on the screen, it might just look a little discolored. And if it didn't mess with it, then it could be that the magnetic field was out the back or the bottom or whatever. Um, I still wouldn't keep it too close. For me personally, what I thought would be taking a speaker and moving it around the CRT and then moving it away and then doubling the distance from when it stopped appearing to affect the CRT till now. I think that's a pretty decent safe bet to start. Um, obviously the best thing to do would be not use magnetically shielded speakers at all within feet of it. But if you have a situation where like the, um, the clip speakers I showed in the video, uh, if I put those next to the CRT, not quite touching it, but close, there was no interference at all. So if I was in a situation where I had like a CRT, a console on each side, and the speakers outside of that, I personally would be comfortable. I don't know if I would feel comfortable making a video or answering a question that said, that's totally safe. I hate that. I, I like to know what I'm talking about. And that is a yes. So that's kind of how I would, would, would phrase that, you know, use this at your own risk. If you have a consumer CRT that you really like, but there's no emotional value to it. You didn't spend a lot of money. Use it underneath if it doesn't discolor. You know, it's fine. But if you just spent a couple grand on a calibrated BVM, give the sound bar away to somebody as a gift. Go buy a set of shielded speakers that are far less than you just spent on your BVM and don't even think about it. So while I was being silly, hopefully that did add some perspective and stuff, because I think I'm very guilty of trying to spend the least amount of money possible. And at the end of the day, I often end up spending more money than I would have spent if I just bought the right thing in the first place by obsessing over how to do it cheaper. So, you know, I always try to find that happy medium between not being frivolous with money and not ending up spending 600 total when I could have just spent 500, but I had to try the $300 solution first. So yeah, I just wanted to share my thoughts on that. Just a reminder that tonight, Friday the 15th at 6 p.m. New York time, I'm going to be doing that whatnot stream where I sell off a bunch of stuff that I purchased for use with the video with Scott, the magnetically shielded speaker video, and some other stuff related to that. Um, definitely check out the post. And most importantly, if you're not on the platform yet and you want to get 10 bucks off your first purchase, use the links that are on that page because who doesn't want free money? Uh, but anyway, um, I'm going to be auctioning off a bunch of this stuff. I'll even auction off those clips sort of shielded speakers if anybody's willing to take the risk to be honest if you put them in a bookshelf away from the crt they'd be perfectly safe for that but anyway um please you know join if you're around uh you obviously don't have to buy anything if you want to just hang out but i've been having a great time on those i'm trying to get more guests with me because uh, i think that always kind of adds to it and hopefully i get to see you all there to uh just check out the the speakers and the weirdness 
So before I go, I just wanted to talk about what the heck I meant before about the video changing. And if you don't care about this stuff, if you don't care about IT and Thunderbolt and capture cards, please stop listening. I don't want to waste your time. I don't want to bore you to death. But my fellow nerds, stick with me for just a few moments. Um, when I originally purchased this computer rig, which is an Asus motherboard, an Asus video card, and an Asus Thunderbolt card, I assumed that I would be able to get some Thunderbolt enclosures and use a bunch of them to house my video cards or my capture cards. So that way, rather than trying to jam everything into one PC, I could have different external cases for like the Datapath Vision, um, for the Hopage uh, composite video one, and for the latest DisplayPort version of the Datapath. And I learned a few things. First of all, the Datapath Vision cards are not compatible with Windows through Thunderbolt, period. It is a Microsoft Windows thing. Windows would have to do a, a pretty important change that affects a lot more than just that. So that's only doable via Linux and I think some tweaking on the drivers. That's a conversation for another day we'll get back to. Second thing, though, the Thunderbolt card never worked. It's like sort of worked, but then didn't. So I ended up having to file an RMA with Asus, which has been the craziest nightmare. I never expected a big company to be like this anymore. It took a week of going back and forth for them to even issue an RMA. And it was a lot of the useless information, a lot of repeating information back and forth, copying and pasting, asking the same shit over and over. I finally got an RMA number and they asked me to pay the shipping back, which, you know, it's a small card, right? So I'll spend the 15 bucks, but uh, that rubbed me the wrong way immediately because I'm pretty sure the card wasn't the problem. Got it to them, it took over a week for them to check it out, and when they eventually got back to me, they said the card was defective, they couldn't repair it, and it was out of stock, they couldn't, they didn't have any more of them, so to just send the invoice, but so they could reimburse me. But the problem is, while I bought the computer, a friend of mine gifted me a bunch of stuff for it, including the Thunderbolt card, so I didn't have that invoice. So that was a couple more days of going back and forth. So I said, fuck it. I bought a brand new one from Amazon. It was like 115 bucks or something like that. I installed it. No changes to the BIOS. No changes to the software. Just plugged it in and everything's working. It's still a little finicky. I'll get to that in a second. Um, but it seemed to work. So it's obviously the card. I emailed them the invoice and they refused to send the card back. They refused to send the invoice for it. They basically are holding my card hostage, are not refunding me the money, and they it's the most ridiculous shit I've seen in a long time. It's annoying, and it's frustrating, and on top of that, it sort of works. So the Thunderbolt card seems to be doing well, and I now put the DisplayPort Datapath card in a Sonnet enclosure, a single PCIe by 8 enclosure. That's how I've been recording this. Lumix GH5, 1080p output, to the Datapath card, which supposedly goes up to 8K, but I've only tested it 4K60. And I hope it's going to work. I cannot imagine there being a problem with the bandwidth of 1080p60. I'll do this again at another point with 4K60, and I, I would like to also find or, or come up with some kind of tools to make sure. But this long bitch fest about Asus's terrible customer support ends in, I don't know yet if it's a good recommendation to use capture cards and stuff like that through Thunderbolt. What I will definitely say is the cards that are built into a motherboard. So if you have a motherboard that has an IO port that has a Thunderbolt three or four port right in it, uh, or, or any of the IMAX Intel based or not, I have had infinitely better uh, support with those. They, I could just plug in a card while Windows is running and it detects the card like a USB device almost. You don't even need a reboot. It's not the case here, but if, um, and ever since I installed this new working one, every other reboot, it doesn't see the Datapath card. But when it does, it seems solid. I've been talking for an hour now, uh, took more than that to record, so it seems okay. But did you see any frame drops? Did you see anything major? Pixelation and compression is going to definitely happen, both because of compression and YouTube and all that stuff. But what are your thoughts on it? Because I have a whole opinion on Thunderbolt devices, and the basic conclusion is that they're just way too expensive. And I think they're only expensive because they can, 
and you know meaning manufacturers just no one's complaining so they're doing it but also when you make a usb device that's general purpose you're going to sell thousands hundreds of thousands of them whereas you sell a thunderbolt device you're going to sell hundreds maybe thousands so the quantity issue is definitely there but Besides that, using, uh, you know, don't mess around with cards or motherboards that require expansion cards, so you'll probably have all the problems I'm having. If it's built in, fine, uh, but check compatibility on the capture cards you're working with. But I'm not sure if I'm going to keep it this way. Um, to be honest, like this whole experience really just, I, I lost so much respect for Asus after this. People had warned me. You on social media had warned me about this, but uh, but yeah, it's... um. Yeah, it, it, to say it's disappointing is it, just the tip of the iceberg. You know, I've never heard of a big company giving somebody who just purchased a ton of Asus stuff a problem over something they confirmed is bad. So I, I don't know what the fuck they're going on about. But Thunderbolt, what do you think? Can you see a difference? Like I tried the whole wave my hands test. I tried doing some basic captures, but not over 1080p 60. Seems fine. What are all anybody who's experimented with this? Um, all of the stuff that I do like this behind the scenes isn't just for my own testing and benefit. Bitching about Asus was, I'll give you that. But all of the stuff, the computer I built, the components that I'm connecting to it, the stuff that I've been reviewing is all going towards one much bigger project that I'm hoping to have out by the end of the summer. But the one thing I'm still on the fence about is do I even discuss Thunderbolt at all? Or do I just say the truth in that how how much easier it is overall to have them internally. The problem is, though, that might not be an option for very much longer going forward. Motherboards are having less PCI slots because all of the bandwidth and the lanes are being used up by the PCI Express 4 and 5 SSDs, as well as things like Thunderbolt. So you might have to use external solutions for certain capture cards in the future. So, uh, yeah, what's your thoughts on that? Thunderbolt on how to get my money back from ASUS if you work for them. Please, give me some advice here, because that shit's ridiculous. Um, frame rates through Thunderbolt versus direct PCI should be the same, but if it was the same, why, how come the Evermedia Live Gamer Bolt is capped at 4K50, and the Live Gamer that's internal can go up to 4K60? Is it something they did? Is it inherent to Thunderbolt? I don't know. That's kind of what I'm digging into with all of this stuff. So uh, once again, you know, sorry to waste your time if you just let the podcast play and you don't give a shit about bad customer service or some kind of PC project I'm working on. But if you are a fellow nerd that can help with any of those things, please just let me know because it's going to be a few more months before I put this whole video project together thing. But um, I'm trying to get it right and I'm trying to do it in a way that would save everybody time, money and hassle and also streamline the way people capture their and stream even just for basic streamers i'm trying to, to help out so uh any thoughts would be appreciated well that's it for this time if you're new to these q a's ask any question you would like wherever it is that you support just please put the question under the latest q a post the way these services work i can't really figure out what's a new post on an older question and i as you saw today i just enjoy scrolling through in real time and just kind of answering them as they come at me but anyway as always thank you so much to everybody who participates in these everybody who supports in any way possible because it's you who's keeping this going so thank you all very much and i'll see you next week or in the whatnot stream tonight yeah hopefully i'll see you in the whatnot stream